last decade, we have seen a surge in Indian mythology and historical fiction writing. Amish Tripathi, Anand Nilkantan, Ashwin Sanghi are some of the biggest commercial successes India has produced in the last decade. And today, in this episode of Between the Lines, I have with me one among these big, big names. A hugely successful writer whose characters get love notes and real-life hero recommendations almost every day. He has to his credit over one lakh copies of Harappa series that continue to sell like hotcakes. His new book, Another Historical Fiction Mastan, continues to be on the bestsellers category. I have with me Vineet Bajpai, who has a magic wand that turns everything he touches to gold. I'll get back to telling you more about this very interesting personality. But for now, let's get chatting with this best-selling author of several books and one of the most celebrated young entrepreneurs and CEOs in India about why mythology and historical fiction has piqued reader interest in the last decade. Welcome, Vineet. We are so excited to have you on our show. Hi, Lipika. Thank you so very much. It's absolutely wonderful to be with you. And, uh, you know, there are two reasons why I'm so delighted to be with you. One, because you're such a dear friend. And two, because you're such an authority, uh, you know, in the book trade that every time I interact with you, I end up learning something. So, uh, so it's great to be with you, Lipika. Oh, I'm so flattered. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for making time. Uh, Vineet, I would start with... Uh, where do you keep this magic wand and this book of magic which makes everything that you start turn into a success? No, I think you're just being very generous. Uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not really a magic wand. And uh, I would just, you know, uh, just like to uh, share a quote by uh, the founder and CEO of LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, and he says in one of his quotes that... Uh, all you need to be uh, an overnight success is hard work, perseverance in 15 years. So, uh, you know, so what appears to be overnight and what appears to be a magic wand uh, to several people actually involves years of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, very good but very intense hard work, uh, lots of struggle and, and most of all, I think the support of a very fabulous team. Uh, in everything that I do, whether it is my companies, whether it is my books, whether it is uh, promoting the books. You are one of the people, uh, you know, who's played such a key role in whatever little success uh, we've been able to see. So I think, yeah, it's, there's no magic wand. It's just a, it's a magic potion with all these ingredients coming in. Uh, why do you think uh, your books and books in the mythological and historical fiction uh, strike such a chord with readers? Libika, I think what has happened is uh, uh, at the beginning of this, uh, uh, you know, interaction when you were introducing me, you took names of some really accomplished authors. And I think what has really happened is that there is a resurgence in India in every way. I think as a nation, we are really finding a huge amount of self-confidence. Uh, we are finding ourselves to be, uh, you know, indomitable as a country, indomitable as a people. And that is reflecting in everything. You know, when we work with international clients and international partners, the kind of respect that Indian businesses, Indian entrepreneurs, Indian industry is commanding. When we look at any, any space, whether it is tourism, whether it is entertainment, I think India is really, really making its mark. And the people of India, you know, I think the generation that you and I belong to and the millennials, uh, you know, who are going to follow us, I think everybody is finding a very strong sense of confidence sense of belief, uh, you know, in our country, in our culture. And I think that is also reflecting in the choices that we are making in terms of entertainment or, uh, you know, in terms of uh, literature or the kind of work that we are consuming. There is a lot, uh, you know, we've, uh, when we were growing up, we've seen all the, all those lovely movies which were made by uh, Hollywood on Western mythology, whether it was, you know, uh, uh, Ben-Hur or, uh, you know, there were so many others. You know, Western mythology, epics, uh, thrillers, history, uh, all the Spartacuses and, you know, all those things that we grew up watching. And it was always, uh, you know, something that was uh, always behind, um, you know, at the, at the back of my mind was, why are we not doing similar things for India? The kind of richness that we have in our epics, the kind of uh, 
uh, you know, absolute beauty, um, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, how vivid our epics are, the kind of uh, fantasy that can be created, the intensity of characters, the richness of, uh, you know, storytelling uh, is absolutely phenomenal, uh, you know, in our mythology and, and also our history. And I think what has simply happened is that, uh, you know, a set of authors have really brought that out brought it into the hands of readers, uh, you know, of this generation and of millennials. And, uh, uh, and like I described, you know, the sense of confidence and belief that we have is also getting extended into what we want to read and what we want to consume. And I think it's these two factors coming together. But there is also a section of followers and readers, uh, you know, who feel that reimagining events uh, the historical events distorts them and especially in cases of epics. Uh, in fact, at times they take offense, uh, you know, when uh, people reimagine and try to rewrite uh, lives of Rama and Sita and share their perspective through these, uh, you know, uh, phenom phenomenal characters. How much of that fear really impacts uh, your writing? Uh, just, just a comment before I answer your question, uh, is that, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the greatest things about, you know, when you and I speak and when you mention Amish or Ashwin or, or, you know, or my work, we are primarily, primarily talking about retelling of Hindu history and mythology or Sanatan history and, you know, mythology. And I think I know you as a person uh, and I've known you for years as a person and you know me for years as a person and I think we are both uh, people who have extreme respect for all religions and all faiths. Uh, so, uh, but I'm, because we are speaking in the perspective of the work that is being done, I'm speaking about Hindu mythology. And uh, I think, you know, there are more than 600 versions of the Ramayana. Uh, you know, all the way from, uh, from uh, when I think Valmiki ji wrote it, uh, you know, right down to Ramcharit Manas and to Kambh Ramayana and to finally so many other versions uh, that have happened. But the story still remains more or less the same and, you know, it's, it remains untouched. I think what is important to understand is to what degree are you going to take liberty with the story? And uh, is there a sense of respect in what you are doing? So, you know, of course, the next question is going to be that who decides what that line is and who decides, you know, what the line of liberty is. But I will give you my, uh, you know, my um, take on this. Uh, you know, so we've all seen Shole, and there's a there's a scene in Shole where Dharmendra goes and hides behind Lord Shiva, and he speaks with a uh, you know with a makeshift bhopu kind of a thing and in, in a loud voice uh, to Hema Malini. Now that is something that can offend a, uh, you know a, a section of people, but it doesn't offend me because it does not uh, you know take away anything from the glory of Lord Shiva. In fact. It is. It shows the richness and the comfort that the Hindu religion has with its gods, and how we are able to embrace gods as friends, embrace gods as uh, you know one amongst us, and yet have intense reverence, uh, you know, towards them. On the other hand, when there is, uh, you know, when we when we talk about uh, freedom of expression or arts for art's sake, and we see that there is an M. F. Hussain who is painting. Uh, you know, Ma Saraswati in the nude, for me, I think that is taking it, you know, uh, beyond a certain level of liberty that should be taken. Because it, I don't think anybody would be, uh, uh, would doubt the fact that this will offend the sensibilities of Hindus. So I think, uh, you know, uh, Hindu religion really allows us to interpret it, reinterpret it, write it in our own way, with our own love showered in, with our own interpretation of the characters. But as long as we are keeping them in the, uh, you know, in the boundaries of love, respect and what they stand for, I think it's fine. I'll share an example with you. I'm not going to name the author. She's a good friend of mine. Uh, we've shared the stage at a couple of literature festivals. Um, uh, you know, but, but she writes a story about, uh, you know, one Puranical character who's, who's essentially a woman. And she writes a story, uh, you know, uh, writing about or transforming that woman character into a transgender. Uh, you know, or somebody or somebody starts writing, uh, you know, saying that what would Sita's life be if she had not married Ram and how a very feministic view is taken of how glorious her life would have been if she had never married Lord Ram. 
So I think uh, you know it, uh, the good part about, uh, like I said about, uh, you know, being able to write and interpret Hindu mythology is that you don't have to be afraid. Nobody is going to come after you. Nobody is going to enter your offices and shoot everybody. Uh, Nobody is going to, uh, you know, um, issue death threats. Uh, there's going to be no section of the society which is going to talk about banning you and hurting you or harming you. Yes, there will be some people who will be upset, they'll write a few comments on social media, but that's that's the limit to which I would say any kind of a Hindu backlash will happen on you. So I think we are all very, very fortunate to be able to write about this culture, about this religion and about the freedom it gives me. Uh, and to finally answer your question, uh, I have never felt, felt even an iota of fear or even an iota of concern on this point. Uh, A, because uh, my my all my books are basically new characters. You know, there's a historical or a mythological backdrop, but all the characters are new. And even if I hint at a character from Hindu mythology, like my book Prale, uh, you know, describes a character called Matsya, which is based on the Matsya avatar and left to the interpretation of the reader whether he's God or not, uh, I, I write about him with so much fondness and with so much, uh, you know, depth of love uh, that I don't think I can go wrong. Do you think uh, that a nationalistic sentiment that is on the rise according to the conversations that happen or uh, the politics of the country, uh, does that in some way affect the kind of books that are read and written? I mean, now that you've uh, detailed in on, uh, you know, how interpretations vary and how we are very, um, you know, uh, we accept all kinds of versions of how we see our uh, epics and mythological uh, characters. Uh, do you think that uh, the politics of a country also has a large role to play? Do you think writers are more comfortable today uh, uh, talking more about, uh, you know, the Hindu culture and our own history that's been long forgotten? Uh, you know, Lipika, talking about nationalism, I think what is important to understand is that uh, we all grew up uh, learning a word and respecting a word called, word called patriotism. When that word suddenly got metamorphosed into, uh, you know, a term called nationalism, we didn't even find out. And today I think, uh, you know, there's a very blurry line between being a patriot and being a nationalist. I don't recognize it, I don't understand how that works, but apparently a lot of people do. Uh, if you go by uh, what social media says and if you go by what is happening, uh, what is being written about. Uh, but what I think is, and you know, this is something that I wrote, uh, I, I, uh, I spoke in an interview with, um, with Reuters and uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was about what is a Hindu and who is a Hindu. And, uh, and you will be amazed to know that my piece was picked up by the Dawn, one of the largest newspapers of Pakistan. Uh, you know, and it was, and it was uh, published there. And when I said that, you know, when you talk about nationalism in India, and if you try and confuse it with Hinduism or, you know, uh, what some people try and do, please understand what a Hindu is. And I said a Hindu is somebody who, who lives in a small house somewhere in a small town in India. She is not bothered about, uh, you know, what religion government uh, uh, or what caste government has come to her state. She doesn't bother about which god her neighbor worships, whether her god is better or the neighbor's god is better. She doesn't go out to talk to anybody and, you know, convince them to change to her religion. She does not go out and threaten anybody that, you know, if you don't follow my religion, so and so will happen to you. She has a small wooden temple nailed to the wall of her small home with lots of photographs of gods. When she needs money, she turns to Lakshmi. When she wants her son's exam to go well, she turns to Saraswati. She does, she lights a small dhup and diya in that small corner and does her Janmashtami ki puja. She, does, she, she doesn't attend any religious congregations. She has absolutely no sense of how her religion is connected to politics. So this is what Hindu, Hindu religion is. But what we also must remember is, and like I saw in a Govind Dehlani film, a beautiful line uh, which said, violence not only generates violence, it also propagates counter-violence. So if there are, you know, certain faiths and certain communities which indulge in politically motivated saber rattling all the time, 
if I keep coming and telling you that, look, at the end of the day, my God is better than yours and eventually I will convert you. Wait and watch. Or if I keep, uh, you know, um, mixing my religion with politics, that is that effect is going to rub off on even the most peaceful religion. There are certain countries, uh, you know, which I read about where the Buddhists are now raising uh, weapons to safeguard themselves or to fight against, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, marauders in the name of religion. So perhaps the reason why uh, you know we speak about nationalism is because of all these uh, reasons. Perhaps because a religion which was supposed to be uh, you know subdued and supposed to not raise its head and supposed to not have opinions uh, and supposed to basically absorb everything that anybody sent its way has now started to talk back. And I think that is uh, you know why the whole conversation about nationalism is coming. But I don't think it has much to do with the, uh, with the kind of written work that is happening because we are a nation where, you know, we were writing uh, Anand Mutt uh, and Bande Matram when the British were ruling. So it's not as if, uh, you know, political flavor of the day encourages or discourages writers of this great nation. I think we are a country which is fearless. I think our uh, artists, our writers, we are fearless. And in fact, it's the other way around. The more you try and press me towards one direction, the more I will, uh, you know, write about the other. So I don't think uh, that uh, nationalism has any effect on the work. But uh, but yes, of course, we are all humans and we all get influenced by our surroundings. A lot of our history is lost in the inflections that our country has had and had to go through over the last thousands of years. And uh, a lot of our ancient heritage uh, and, uh, you know, culture was also lost with the passage of time. Uh, and your books, right from the first of the Harappa series to now Mastan, uh, does pick from our history. How difficult has it been for you to research? I mean, has, it, has there been enough literature you felt you uh, didn't really need to uh, look for more or uh, do you think there is actually you you found uh, uh, you know you found it difficult to uh, look for appropriate literature and adequate literature to uh, research for your books? Uh, Libika, I think uh, in that sense we are a, uh, you know we are fortunate because we live in the times of the internet. Uh, I was watching Discovery of India with my daughter one day. And when she saw the size of the book, we were watching the uh, uh, the Sham Benegal Doordarshan archive, uh, you know, show the Discovery of India. And when I told her that this was a book, and that Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru wrote it between 1942 and 1946 while he was in the Ahmednagar prison, she just couldn't believe it. She was like, "Where did he get all his research from?" And in fact, that set me thinking also. So I think, uh, in that sense, we are not in the Ahmednagar prison. And we have a lot of access to a lot of material. What is also happening is that the internet has allowed us to break free uh, from prescribed literature. You know, so if uh, if there was a time when you entered the library of my college, Hansraj College in Delhi University, uh, you would probably find uh, Romila Papar's books, you know, in all the sections, or you would find Bipan Chandra's books in all the uh, you know historical sections. What the internet allows us to do is it allows us to uh, of course, these are awesome authors and they've done work which is so profound and irrespective of all the or some of the controversies that, you know, sometimes come and hit great people always, I think they are fabulous work, uh, bodies of work. But what the internet allows us to do is it allows us to uh, go one layer deeper and move these, you know, the first line of the books in the shelves and then we go and try and search for, you know, what is not really so out there in uh, uh, in public domain. But yes, uh, you know, it does take a lot of research. I, I spent a lot of time researching for Harappa. Of course, I couldn't visit it. Uh, this was, uh, you know, a, one of the one of the most painful, uh, I would say, regrets uh, of being, of writing uh, the Harappa trilogy. Today, when you go to Amazon and you type Harappa, the first suggested keyword comes Harappa by Vineet Bajpai or Harappa trilogy by Vineet Bajpai. So, which basically means that my name is now associated to the Harappan civilization in a very beautiful way. Uh, but of course, I couldn't go there to research for obvious reasons. Professor Om Thanvi, uh, who's, who's written a travelogue on his uh, visit to Mohenjo-daro, 
he and I were in the same panel uh, at the Jaipur Literature Festival. And he was describing how much hardship he went through to visit Harappa. And he was saying, Ki dekhye, and you know, he speaks in this beautiful English, uh, you know, mix of English and Hindi. And he said, Dekhye, India or Pakistan, ye kar diya ki jab koi Pakistan se aata hai, to usko hum Taj Mahal nahi dekhne dete hain. Aur koi Hindustan se jata hai, to wo log usko Harappa aur Mohenjo-daro nahi dekhne dete hain. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, uh, you know, the physical visits could not happen, but yes, there was a lot of research and there is a lot of material available. In fact, more than one can, uh, uh, you know, consume and comprehend and assimilate. Vineet is the founder and chairman of Magnum one of the largest advertising and digital agencies in India, now part of the Fortune 500 Omnicom Group. He's also the founder and CEO of Talent Track, the country's leading online platform for hiring talent for media and entertainment sector. During a career spanning two decades, Bajpai has been felicitated with several awards, including the Asia Pacific Entrepreneurship Award, the CNBC TV Mercedes Benz Young Turks Award, Entrepreneur Magazine's Entrepreneur of the Year Award, the Impact Magazine listed him among the 100 most influential people in India's digital ecosystem. His management books, Built from the Scratch, The Street to the Highway, and The 30 Something CEO, published by Jayco, have been regular sellers in the business and self help category. For Harappa series, Bajpai has been compared with the likes of Dan Brown and George R. R. Martin. A serial entrepreneur. Um, what's with this constant urge for creating things, uh, be it organizations or characters? <laughs> Nobody's ever put it like that. And it almost sounds funny when you do. Uh, Yes, that's, that, that's a perspective, that's a way, way to look at it, and I, I think I'll have to think about this one. Uh, but, you know, when I started my first company, Magnon, it was purely uh, with the, uh, you know, with the guts and glory and the fire in the belly that any first generation entrepreneur starts out with. And uh, this was way back in the year 1999, 2000, uh, you know, and the whole dot-com wave had hit the world and Jeff Bezos had been declared. Uh, Time Magazine Person of the Year, and like they say, heroes tales travel far. So, so India was not far behind. There were, you know, big companies being set up here. Not really big, big investors were chasing uh, big valuations. Companies weren't big, uh, but the but the whole, you know, that whole wave happened. Um, so, I started a small company, uh, you know, with two rented computers from a generator room at the top of a building in Lajpat Nagar. But, uh, you know, the, uh, so that was the beginning of my first company. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, I think that was really the first chapter of, uh, uh, of whatever little success God has sent my way. Uh, Magnon is now 20 years old. We are, we are celebrating its 20th year this year. Uh, it's now part of the uh, Fortune 200 Omnicom group. Uh, perhaps the largest uh, communications and marketing conglomerate in the world. We are part of the... EG Plus Worldwide Network in TBWA, you know, some of the most uh, 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 the most uh, creative companies in the world. So that was, you know, uh, the first company, uh, which was uh, an exciting journey. The things that happened after that were really extensions of what I felt, uh, you know, was, was a gap in the market and it, it really needed to be, uh, you know, filled. So, for example, with Talent Track, you know, I saw the film industry. And being from advertising, I was working with actors and models in production houses and, um, you know, and uh, uh, shootings and all of that. And what I realized was that, uh, you know, the media and entertainment sector was, uh, was booming in India, poised to reach 100 billion by 2030 as per a, uh, you know, KPMG and Fiki report, I think. Um, and such a massive sector, millions of people uh, employed in it and a sector which is completely dependent on talent had absolutely no talent aggregator. You know, there was no tech disruption that had happened on the human resources, casting and talent management side. Uh, and it was, I think, a glaring gap in which is where we uh, we came out with Talent Track and now it is the biggest aggregator, uh, not just in India, I think in the world with more than 400,000 performing artists registered, more than 15,000 um, filmmakers, television channels, radio channels, event companies, production houses, ad agencies, 
all of them being you know on the recruiter side. So uh, yeah, so it's uh, I don't know if it's an urge to create something new. I think it's just uh, uh, excitement about the you know building value and being able to uh, build things which might uh, stay in this world long after we are gone. And you sing. You have your own studio set up for yourself. Is that correct? No, no, that is, that is, you know, sometimes we make a huge mistake and one of the mistakes I made was that I posted a video on social media where I was singing with a guitar and for some reason everybody felt that, you know, I have a studio or something like that. No, so I'm a frustrated singer and guitarist. I basically, uh, you know, uh, pick up the guitar after I'm, I'm with friends around a bonfire or maybe, you know, once one has had a couple of glasses of wine. So that's the only singing that I do, but, but nothing more than that. And what is it that you can't do? What I can't do is build a physique like Salman Khan. Uh, you know, so ever, since, ever since I saw, ever since I was back in, I, I remember I was doing MBA when Salman's song came, uh, Oh Jane Jana, where he, where he dances on the stage topless and he looks so gorgeous. And at that time, I told myself that one day, one day will come and I'll build a physique like him. I think 25 years have passed and it, that day hasn't come. So yes, that is, uh, but I've not lost hope, I must tell you. I'm waiting for that, you know, those one or two or three months where I get a little more time to focus on myself and I will embark on that project. But yes, so far, that's what I've not been able to do. Uh, but success after success after success, who keeps you grounded? Uh, I think the, uh, everything that happens behind the scenes when you chase success, uh, I think that keeps one grounded. You know, what people see outside is a flashy new book launched at a five-star hotel, uh, you know, on a stage and then followed up by media coverage and social media ads and re book signing tours of the author and it all looks so glamorous. But it's the author who knows the grind that has gone into writing that book, researching that book, those hours spent at night, uh, you know, researching Harappa and Mohenjo Daro, or researching the, uh, uh, the first war of independence of 1857. Uh, you know, you would know the whole grind that goes into publishing of a book, uh, you know, the editing, the creatives and all of that, uh, you know, that happens. So I think, uh, I think that process keeps you grounded. You know, it's like I said, uh, when you're building a company, what people see is a finished product or, you know, a product which is already successful. But it's only the entrepreneur who knows what, how much that, uh, you know, that success has taken away from him or her. So I think it's that process. It's the knowledge of uh, what it has taken away from you uh, that keeps one grounded. At least that's what keeps me grounded. And uh, in the end, one last question before... Um I let you go. Uh, what would you like to tell writers who are exploring the historical and mythological journey? Um, the, f the first and foremost thing I would tell them uh, is something that I followed myself. And I'll say this with a, I'll share this with you with a deep sense of humility. And I think Lipika, you and I have spoken about it, you know, offline also. That uh, before I started writing Harappa, when I was seeing what is happening in the historical or mythological space and it continues to happen and you might appreciate the point I'm trying to establish here all the work that is being done is basically just interpretation reinterpretation and re reinterpretation of existing characters and stories in our epics and you know in our mythology and history I have personally seen five different books about Draupadi you know with five different interpretations uh, you would have seen books about Shiva and Vishnu and Ram and Sita and, you know, and all uh, Hindu gods and, and all of that. The problem that I see is that while it is good, you know, it's okay if you're interpreting, reinterpreting, it, it defeats the very purpose of pure, unadulterated, original creativity. So, uh, you know, what I mean by saying that is when you're writing about Ravan, you already have the story in place, you have the character in place, you have the nuances and the eccentricities of the character in place and not undermining, uh, you know, not taking anything away from anybody who writes about Ravan, you know, uh, everybody's free to do what they are doing and, uh, and some of them have done a fantastic job. But what I'm trying to say is that you already have 
you know, an eclectic character. You have his nuances. You have his backdrop, background. You have his uh, strengths and weaknesses. You have the story. So then it looks like, you know, just a fossil brush, which is uh, basically creating a certain amount of re reinterpretation around it. Whereas what I try to do with Harappa and what I will continue to try and do is, and what I've done with Mastan also, is that there is a mythological backdrop. So when you see uh, the Harappa trilogy, and by the way, we've crossed two lakh uh, copies. Uh, yes, so so uh, so I just thought I'd share that with you. Uh, but Harappa, Pella and Kashi, uh, you know, if you see that there is a mythological backdrop at some places, or like the Times of India very fondly said that the Harappa trilogy transcends genre categorization. You know, it has mythology, it has history, it has fantasy, it has crime, it has a bit of romance, it has intrigue, uh, you know, international organized um, crime and all of that. Uh, but you will see that there is historical and mythological underpinning to those stories, but everything else is new. The characters are new, the storylines are new, uh, the conspiracies, the, uh, the grey areas of the characters, the love, the deceit, everything is absolutely new. The same is with Mastan. When you see Mastan, of course, there is a backdrop of, uh, you know, the walled city and during the, the Great Mutiny of 1857. Of course, there is Mirza Ghalib mentioned at a few places. There is Bahadur Shah Zafar and there will be, uh, you know, a mention of the East India Company. But the rest of it, the characters in the entire storyline is absolutely new and original. Uh, so my suggestion to anybody who is, you know, working in this genre and, and what I would recommend to them is that Please write about, you know, use Indian mythology, use Indian history, but create, create something new, create something immortal, create something which will be known by your name, somebody, some character, some story, some place, some plot, something that you have created, you know, from scratch. And I think that is what readers would love. Uh, I think readers might have had a bit enough of reading about all the Rakshasas and all the Devi Devtas of Hindu religion. Let's now try and give them something different. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Vineet. It's always wonderful talking to you. And um, I mean, I know you wear uh, a lot many hats and it's very difficult for you to make time for any such crazy things that I have requested you to do today. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much for being with me here today. And I look forward to your next uh, book uh, and next creation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepika. And like I said at the beginning of the interview, it's, uh, you know, speaking with you, it doesn't seem like I'm speaking to, uh, you know, uh, somebody from the book trade or so. It's, it's just being with a friend. And, and, and congratulations to your company, Market My Book. I think you have done such a fantastic job. Very important thing to say is that I think you've really created a niche for a specialized PR and marketing just for books. Uh, and I think it's a great step and you have, uh, you know, you'll sky's the limit for you and your company. It means a lot coming from you, Vineet. It means a lot coming from you. Thank you. So that was Vineet Bajpai, the brilliant author of the Harappa series and now Mastan. Harappa, as he's already shared, has already crossed about 2 lakh copies, which is huge when it comes to the kind of numbers uh, any book does in a particular genre. With this, I'm signing off. Until the next time and a new personality, keep reading, keep smiling and stay safe. Yes, and before I sign out, do not forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Bye-bye.